My name's Kate Glenister. I am the Tech Challenge publisher of the upcoming new editions of Legal Studies for VCA here at OUP. Um, I would like to welcome you all to the second session that we're running uh, online for Legal Studies for VCA. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Wondry people as the traditional owners of the land on which this session is being held and pay my respects to Aboriginal elders past, present and emerging. I just wanted to pop in ahead of the session and thank you all for your interest and enthusiasm in joining us online today, especially in the midst of returning to full-time remote teaching this week. Despite these challenges, there are around 100 of you online today and we are very grateful for that. Of course, we'd rather be with you in person, but nevertheless, we're very grateful for the chance to offer you some PD virtually. I just wanted to get into some housekeeping before we get started. Um, you won't be able to use your cameras or your microphones during the session. However, you can post questions in the Q&A section of the event. These questions will be moderated by our team running the event, and some of them will be answered by Lisa and Peter during the Q&A portion of the session towards the end. Um, this is the second webinar that we're running for secondary teachers, so I do ask that you are patient with us. Um, I will return at the end of the session uh, to talk a little bit about the new additions for Legal Studies for VC from Oxford and what happens next after the webinar. But in the meantime, please sit back and grab a tea or a coffee or a big glass of wine if you're at home and enjoy what I'm sure is to be a wonderful discussion between two experts in the field of VC Legal, Lisa Philippin and Peter Farrer. So over to you, Lisa and Peter. Hi Kate, thanks for that um, and thanks for the lovely introduction and welcome everyone to this session. It's so great to hear so many people having attended, notwithstanding the challenges of this week, returning to remote teaching after Sunday's announcement and I just wanted to acknowledge um, what an um, extraordinary year it's been so far and how trying it's been on lots of different um, people, both personally and professionally. So. Um, Hopefully you all feel like we're all in this together and in particular all in it together to um, speed the um, students up towards the end of year examination and their assessment tasks that they're now doing remotely. Um, um, in terms of by way of intro introduction, I'm currently on parental leave at the moment. So if I have a cameo appearance by one or more of my um, three children, then I'm going to apologise in advance. I'll hopefully um, not have too many disruptions. Um, but I've been spending my days um, teaching my little preppy and um, feeding my little six-week-old and looking after my three-year-old, um, as well as looking at the final layouts of this um, new editions of these textbooks, which are looking great, um, which is great to see. I'll pass on to Peter to introduce himself, and then I might um, kick off with the first few slides. Peter and I will be tick-tacking throughout the course of the webinar, though, and sort of providing our input on each slide. Over to you, Peter. Great, great, Lisa. Thank you very much. I would like... like to welcome you all, I've, um, I feel your uh, pain going back to the remote learning this week, and um, it's probably ideal in terms of the timing. We all need to, you know, support each other and um, share some ideas about how we're going to get through the next seven weeks of this term and how we're going to plan for fourth term. So it's, um, I see this as being a little, you know, community where we can share some ideas and um, uh, work out the best way to use a virtual environment to actually get. Um, uh, through the course in a meaningful way. I've been uh, teaching for 33 years. I also teach VC literature and global global politics. So, um, you know, I've sort of come from a very literary, you know, background in terms of what I, I've done. And what I've noticed with legal studies the last, certainly with, with the new course, it's got a very literate uh, focus in terms of um, the stimulus material. So when, you know, Lisa and I and Annie and others and uh, Kate, talked about the best focus for uh, the workshops, we looked at the scenarios and thought this is really an ideal place place to start because if you taught Unit 3 4 last year, you would know that was a quite uh, quite a serious matter for some of the students who weren't used to reading volumes and um, so that will be that will be the focus this afternoon and we're really pleased that we can share the, uh, the afternoon with you and um, I'd like to thank you for giving up your time to, you know, to join, join the session. It's, um, you must have so much to do in terms of you know, planning. So we might move on. Lisa, what do you think to the first slide? Yeah, let's go on to the next slide. And um, we did this webinar on Monday, and I've got to say, I think it's the way of the future. It was so nice to do it from home and then just shut off the computer and be able to have dinner pretty quickly afterwards, though, without having to beat traffic. So hope you get to um, enjoy the benefits of webinar, notwithstanding we're not there in person. What we're going to um, discuss in this um, agenda, or the agenda for today, 
Um, we'll, we'll very briefly look at a review of what we think analyze, apply and synthesize is, what, what the tasks are requiring um, the students to do, why they're relevant in relation to this course. Um, and then we'll provide some examples of stimulus material, not only what we've seen from the examination, but also what we've um, what we've included in the book as well. And then we'll go through some advice for students and then questions at the end. So I know that there is a chat um, section where you can pop in your questions. Please feel free to do it. We'll get through as many as we can. Peter and I can't see the questions throughout this um, session. So um, I'm sorry, we can't address them throughout. Um, so put them in and be rest assured that we'll get to them um, if not at the end of the session, then you can um, touch base with us later on. Um, Peter, I might just quickly, briefly touch upon this. Um, and there, there was a, a Comview um, session that I did on this a couple of years ago about what it meant to really synthesise. And the way that I see the analysis and the synth synthesis working is they're sort of um, they sort of sort of happen in tandem or in pairs, and often um, they happen quite organically. You need to analyse and synthesise something to be able to answer a question without students not necessarily knowing that they're actually doing that analysis and synthesis in the background. So the way I see it in that analysis is you're given something and you've got to kind of pull it apart. You've got to break it down into smaller bits of information and show it, see how they relate to each other. And then synthesis is pulling all of that information back together into a coherent way. Um, the best sort of synthesis style uh, examples that I've seen is where you've got three or two or three different source materials and you are trying to find connections between those sources and pull it together and then have it in and, and then formulate a response. And I think the application is really again happening in the background where you're making all of this relevant to a particular set of fact or circumstances. So a set of data, for example, where it, whether it's um, a table of the Commonwealth Parliament or whether it's statistics of Victoria and New South Wales trends, that doesn't mean anything unless you're asked to apply it to a set of fact or circumstances. So when you're looking at Victorian data on um, assault and then you're looking at the Queensland data on assault in Unit 1, for example, break it up the students need to break it apart pull it back together and then answer a question and make it relevant to what you're asking them to do um peter did you want to add anything onto that onto that slide or anything add anything about that analysis or synthesis yeah i think the main thing is um as we as we work through unit four suddenly as we near 4.2 rather than getting them to read one set of facts maybe put in two or even three just the, and they they can be fairly short but for them to learn how to how to read three different sets of data or stimulus and to be able to find a link to thread those thread those together and then link it to the question is quite quite a skill. Yeah. And um, Lisa is absolutely right. It's learning how to synthesize what is unfamiliar material. And if you look at last year's exam, in fact, um, the 2018 exam, Lisa, that was one with the solarium case study, I think. The tiny beds, yeah. Yeah, and they hadn't actually seen that sort of stuff before. We certainly hadn't done the change in the law because it was, from, I think, from 2014 or 2013. So for them not to panic when they see something which they haven't done, and they think, well, we haven't actually, like, you know, studied this um, this bill or studied, you know, the act. But for them to say, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna read this. I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to glean the main issues, and I'm then gonna try to look for a thread to actually join them. So, like, you know, Lisa's point is really vital there there might be two or three two or three pieces connected to the questions and they need to be able to link them and that's that's quite a difficult job if they do it for the first time so if we can do that as much as we can through uh third term and as we lead into the third term break that is ideal for them Okay, and, and, look, and, and we'll talk. We'll talk a little bit more about where this synthesis and application fits into the study design. But it certainly it does underpin almost everything that they do. Um, and I wanted to make the point about the trends and statistics in Unit One because it, that is a real opportunity for them to analyse and synthesise in Unit One with those trends and data and statistics on crime. Um, a really rich opportunity to use that source material. And so what I wanted to sort of try and do is maybe for your students to be able to say, well, how am I actually analysing, applying and synthesising? This is a non-legal example and I understand you'll get the slides um, in a couple of weeks' time, but it's really looking at information and picking it apart. So analysing the information and then pulling it all together again to answer a question that's applicable to the scenario. So in this example, whilst it's a really straightforward, perhaps a mathematical type example, what it's requiring the students to do is understand really basic concepts around 
apples, bananas, oranges, pears, and calculations. So they're learning that. So say, for example, the key knowledge is being able to calculate and being able to add and subtract and being able to do a fair um, distribution. They learn that in isolation, but then they've got to actually then apply that understanding and pull apart information that's given to them and answer a question. On the next slide is more of a legal example. And I was having a look at this um, case uh, a couple of weeks ago and was as looking at what the judge was saying needed to happen when there was a consideration as to whether a limitation of actions claim that the plaintiff applied for an extension of time to bring their claim for personal injury. So they were out of time, limitation of actions had passed. And the judge in the appeal was actually talking about synthesis. So it was talking about what, what the actual judge needed to do to determine whether to extend the time was to actually synthesise competing considerations and a matrix of factors. So synthesis, if you try and sort of bring that back to your students, it's saying synthesis also happens in sentencing and also happens in application, also happens in decisions because judges need to get a whole bunch of precedents and, and factors and um, facts before them and pull that all the power, analyse it and bring it all together to then make a decision as to whether to extend the limitation period or to whether to um, grant an, an, an objection or whether to limit discovery of documents. It's kind of happening in legal cases all the time. Um, and Peter and I just wanted to briefly mention what it is in the study design that requires students to analyse, apply and synthesise. So there is that key skill which requires apply and synthesise legal principles to actual or hypothetical scenarios, but that's not the only key skill that requires a synthesis application um, and analysis throughout. If you see it, the aims of the study design, it really is requiring students to do it all throughout um, their course through Unit 1, Unit 2, Unit 3 and Unit 4. They've got to apply legal terminology, principles and concepts. They've got to apply legal principles to scenarios, explore solutions, form reasoned conclusions. They've got to analyse institutions. They've got to analyse methods and institutions that determine a resolved dispute. And they've got to analyse reforms to the legal system. Peter, did you want to add anything to the, to the aims? Or I'll just quickly briefly run through the key skills and knowledge and then we might sort of tie it off at the end. Yeah. Um, just actually with this... Um with this, with the new course, um, there's never there's never been so uh, vital that they read the newspaper and discuss a case which is actually going on. They need to be a critical uh, thinker. And um, like when the Pell uh, judgment came down, and we do have a slide on that, we spent a bit of time looking at how the High Court didn't say that uh, Pell didn't do it. They they talked about this about this five minute sort of you know, window in which there has to be a reasonable doubt. Now, that's a, that's a synthesis um, uh, task and then for them to link it back to the course and the way that I actually teach this, we take the case study and then we go back to the course and we try to link it to the course rather than, rather than going from the course out to the case study, we go from the case study back to the course and Lisa is absolutely right. It's learning how to be an analytical thinker and you can do it with um they can write their own their own scenarios but if they can track one through the media they learn to read the course in light of light of, of the cases that that are out there so then they forge that sort of link but it's a fairly it's a fairly nuanced uh, thing and they really need to practice it as much as they can okay thanks lisa some of the examples of key skills that you see throughout the study design you've got an analyze apply relevant information about etc etc and so they they're scattered all throughout the study design you've got that specific synthesize and apply legal information to actual or actual and or hypothetical so unit one unit two unit three unit four either uses the term actual or actual and hypothetical they've got to apply legal reasoning in, in principles but to caveat that that all the other key skills really inherently and i and again say organically requires an analysis analysis, application and synthesis. So for example, a discuss the ability of sanctions to achieve their purposes. When they are asked that question in the context of a specific case, they've got to analyse the facts of the case and they've got to have to break it apart, have a look at the um, factual circumstances and synthesise all of that to say, well, will a sanction achieve its purpose in this particular case? So even though it's use of the task word discussion, there's a synthesis and application happening to be able to engage in that discussion. And I should say, and, and Peter's right, with this study design, and the, the, the intention really truly was move away from the rote learning, move away from having to recite 
the stages of a lawmaking, uh, a bill through Parliament and move towards those lifelong skills, move towards the skills that will really sort of in, not only engage them but will stay with them a lot longer than what um, an explanation of the second reading through Parliament will ever give them. And I'm not sure whether you'll have any student who after, you know, a few months having this at the exam will be able to be able to tell you the stages of a lawmaking through Parliament. But they certainly will, I think, um, remember that problem solving and remember that lifelong skill of being able to apply a situation or apply their understanding to a set of facts. Um, Peter, do you, do you want to make a comment on that or, or add to that? Well, just that when they do follow the media, they learn the language of the course too, Lisa, like they read it in like the media. So when they see, if, if they if they are critical uh, thinkers during the year, they might be a word or a term in the, the end of year exam that they that they they will see and they will actually know it and they will know the process and what they've read throughout the year. When I, I started teaching in 1987, and in 1990s, those of you who also taught then, one of the parts of the course was looking at the case studies during the year and we even actually wrote on them. We did a cat as they were called then. And I always thought that was a really world view part of the course. And um, I think, you know, Lisa is absolutely right. We've swung back, you know, towards that and I find it a much more uh, dynamic part of the course actually. And I'm actually glad it's there, but now we just have to get them over the line to read the stimulus and to be able to bring that back to the course. Mm. Okay. Yeah. And so going on to the next slide, the BCE end of year examination, and, and whilst this webinar is about units one to four, we thought we'd touch on um, the examination. So um, this is taken from the um, the specification. So all of the key skills are examinable. Scenario A may have stimulus material. Scenario B will be scenario based. I might quickly go on to the next slide because I'm sure that um, everyone's familiar with the specifications which haven't changed notwithstanding the COVID-19 study design for 2020. Um, as people know, the examination reports are absolutely critical to read and become familiar with, and then that has some information about synthesis, application and analysis skills, about encouraging students to practice it as much as possible. All Section B responses must make use of the relevant stimulus material, and for Section A it's necessary if it requires reference to or use of them. Um, and I think we've said, I'm just, just having a look at our Chapter 1 legal toolkit for the books, and, and we sort of recommend if students don't know whether to use the stimulus material in Section A, just use it, put it in, because it's erring on the side of caution. And that students should adopt techniques to effectively use their reading time. Um, Annie and I touch base on reading time techniques on the Monday's webinar and happy to sort of talk about that separately because that's not the focus of this webinar. But the, the, reading tech, the reading techniques are important in relation to stimulus material because there's probably more of it than they probably have seen before prior to 2018. So they really need to work out how do they use that 15 minutes in such in an effective way to get across the material that they need to to be able to answer the questions. Really, that's that's sort of why why reading time is so important in this context. Um, Peter, did you want to make comment on that one before I move on to the exam some examples of scenarios? Yeah, and really just back to something which you said. Um, uh, before they said then you're not able to write learn for part uh, for section B there's there's very very little of the right learning you can actually use so um, the other thing I would say is that in your sacks for the rest of the year try to put in a question that's clearly sort of sort of a curveball um, you know where they really need to think what sort of was that um, I gave my students sack 4.1 last week and we gave the breakup of the Senate with the coalition having 30, 36 in the Senate now, and they had to justify why that's uh, an ideal number in terms of a democratic um, sort of you know, process. And it was not that easy. It was, it was sort of based on last year's exam where they had the gender of the House of Reps, Lisa, is that right, or the Senate, or both houses in Section A? Um, in, they, they, had both, they had both last year. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. The House of so that was, a, that was a little bit, you know, curveball, but for them just to think, well, how do I think my way through, and really for them to know you can't actually, you're not able to write load anymore. So certainly for Section B, there's not the gimme marks that we used to have, and that's probably a good thing, and what that does is to redefine how, how we actually, you know, teach, um, and certainly from, you know, now on. Um, when we get to the end of third term, we need to be um, sharing some ideas maybe about how best to actually prep for that. Can I say back to you? Yeah, and I think it, I think it reinforces Peter's point about moving away from 
um, rote learning and moving towards honing the skills because the skills come across the different scenarios. So if you're giving them a scenario that they've never seen before, what you're you're putting the lens on, show me how you can discuss, show you how me how you can evaluate rather than show me what you memorised about this particular case, about this particular key knowledge. So the FAQs on the um, BCAA website provide some examples of scenarios and they provide we just sort of encapsulated that in this into this um, this set of boxes. So they say, you know, scenarios can be a set of facts, a set of stated circumstances, which I think is facts or otherwise. I, I, it could be a case, it could be a referendum, it could be a series of information. So it could be sort of source material, source one, source two, source three. It could be a case study, which, you know, um, could be a hypothetical or an actual. It could be an issue or it could be a series of arguments. So scenario is not just necessarily about, you know, Bob and Ada going down and et cetera, et cetera. It could be all sorts of different um, types of scenarios. Um, the examples, what we've seen from the 2018 and 2019 exam, we've seen hypothetical set of facts. So Bob and Ada, we've seen um, the no guarantees with the formal dress, we've seen Kai and Consumer Affairs Victoria, we've seen lots of different hypothetical facts. We've seen actual sets of facts, for example, the BLRC, the tanning beds, the defamation. We've seen extracts from legislation and constitution, quotes from cases, so the Kawada um, quote. We've seen data, so the Commonwealth Parliament table that um, Peter mentioned. We've seen articles, short statements, and we've seen a combination of all of this um, of source material including legislation. So we've actually seen quite a broad range of different sorts of scenarios or, or how they've actually used the stimulus material. Yep. And I think I think it goes back to Peter mentioning what he did in his sack, but it's about exposing them as much as possible to these different ways um, through your assessment task. And they don't need to be a formal a formal sack. They could just be sort of practice questions. Um, and, in, and in particular, the ones that we've got in the textbook as well. And we've tried to put in as many as we can different types of hypothetical scenarios or different types of stimulus material. Mm. Peter, did you want to make yeah, that yeah. Well, where they get the excerpt from a media report, that's a really high order uh, skill because they need to read read the report. So they need to understand the language of it. And um, uh, if there's any words there that they don't really know, they need to try to glean the meaning and then they need to link it back to um, the overall material and then they need to link it back to the question. So. Um, throw a lot of media um, media for them for, for them to read. Um, I would love my my uh, students to read more. They don't read read much uh, media. Uh, but as I said, around the Pell case, there was there were some fascinating, really really interesting um, uh, media on that. Uh, one of the, one of the main things is well, what's the use of a jury where the High Court, based on the reading of the facts, decides to um, decides what they did, and it was a 7-0 uh, judgment. So to actually get them reading and annotating, you know, the articles, it, it's way back to when I actually sort of, you know, started out in the early 90s and, you know, getting them to read read the media and become a critical thinker of the issues that come out, out of the article. It's a very, it's, it's become a very literary uh, subject, I think, at that sort of um, higher end. It involves reading and thinking and, and synthesising, and I mean that's why we're here doing this doing this session this afternoon. It's to get students thinking right now. And as we near the um, choice of the case study for for four point two, looking at something which is really really interesting that's going to really you know grab them, and they can't learn it out of out of a textbook. I mean they can learn the role of a committee commissions and that, but. They need to do an immersion in the issue, and I, I'm going to let my students choose the issue. Um, they might have two or three different different ones, you know, going. But they need to have a they need to have a reading log. They need to show that they've read and researched. They don't need to do a lot, but they need to show me that they've gone beyond what I've actually given them. And the more that they become a, a, a critical reader, the more they can actually write well because they can link the reading with the stuff out of the course. But that's quite a high order uh, skill. But they don't need to be they don't need to be brilliant in terms of the reading skills, but they need to have the interest in the topic that they're doing. So I would urge you to have two or three different areas and get them to actually, you know, choose the one um, and then that, that, but they need to read beyond what they what they get from you. So they, they need to take the step beyond, beyond the textbook, really, and also beyond the classroom. Mm. Just sort of one thing, um, Fiona, Fiona Patton's a very good, um, a very generous uh, speaker. 
in terms of going into schools and um, given what, you know, she's done, she's really, um, she's brought about some interesting and quite groundbreaking uh, bills in, into the parliament in the last four years. So if you send her like an email, she would be, I, I, I feel quite sure she would be very, very willing to zoom in into your classes or to use Google, Google um, what's this, Microsoft Teams, um, uh, just so they can get a real world view um, of the law, law reform issue. Um, and then they bring that level of interest back to the course and the course suddenly makes a lot more sense than if they sat in, sat in the room and waited for you to actually do that. Mm. Thanks, Lisa. Um, good tip, Peter. I, was, I, was about to, I thought you were going to say get her to come into your school and I was thinking uh, that's, that's not happen. <laughs> what we tried to do, and look, Kate will talk about this later in terms of the features, but we really looked quite critically at sort of the scenarios that we've got in the textbook and we've sort of segmented them into actual scenario and hypothetical scenario to reflect the language in the study design. And so these are the examples and those who are using um, the Oxford textbook will be familiar with the different types of sort of boxes and, and material that we've got, but we tried to simplify it a little bit so that we've got, you know, sort of extracts. So here's an example, we've got an extract of legislation we've got an actual scenario of the um the family class action for those that are familiar with the um 1960s cult where um there was sort of a um children that were taken and um uh and then they're sort of they've, they've initiated a class action for the um, injuries that they've allegedly suffered and then there's the hypothetical scenario so we've got sort of different sort of hypothetical scenarios to be able to um bring out the key knowledge and the key skills for your students. And then we've got data and tables and we've got extracts. So the Rostevsky case is um, a case that we've highlighted in Chapter 12. Peter's done a great job of doing um, DPP and Rostevsky in the recent criminal cases. Um, this is such a fascinating case from the perspective of what, what happened with the offender and um, the, the maintenance of, you know, keeping silent during the whole during the whole case and then sort of agreeing to plead guilty to manslaughter but not to murder, those sorts of things. So it's really interesting. So I've got extracts from the cases. Um, and in particular, we've emphasised in Unit 2 from a stimulus and scenario-based um, perspective to read as much as possible from judgments rather than getting their understanding of cases through the media articles because that again allows them to provide a critical eye to say well what does this media article say and what does it not say in relation to the judgments and that was really the purpose of unit two the recent criminal cases and civil cases is to actually read the cases themselves um, in relation to the next slide, I'm not going to talk um, about that really. People are familiar with the 2019 examination, but it's just emphasising that there is a greater emphasis on applying your um, knowledge to scenario or other stimulus material, and that's what we saw in Section A and Section B last year. And then I might pass on to Peter um, to um, talk us some some tips. But I just thought I'd quickly just mention a couple of some, some advice, and Peter will be able to talk more to this of what he did in Unit um, Four, Area Study One. But one of the things that Annie and I emphasise is consider the mark allocation, or sorry, consider first consider the mark allocation against the number of words. So how much are you requiring them to read, and then how many marks would they get out of that level of reading? So. If you're requiring them to read, for example, a page and a half of material, but then you've got three marks associated with them, I think there's a, there's an imbalance there. So I think the more that they read, the more perhaps marks that you need to allocate to give them the benefit of that of that reading. Um, ensuring proper use of actual and hypothetical. So unit two, um, area study three, for example, requires them to know actual. So actual rights cases, actual rights reform. So pretty much all of your assessment tasks in relation to the area study should be actual scenarios. Um, and the same with that unit four, using the word actual as opposed to unit three, actual or hypothetical. Um, number three, the unit three area study one and area study two actually that should say is there's Victorian civil justice system and the Victorian criminal justice system and that's an important emphasis to make is really the use of Victorian cases because the criminal law and the criminal justice system and civil justice system are state based. And so using um, New South Wales cases, for example, there might be different processes or there might be different words or terminology that's used. Um, the fourth point is ensure you are assessing synthesis where you want it to be assessed and that's, that, that 
goes in conjunction with point five, which is, are your questions truly scenario based or are they standalone tacked onto a scenario that should say? So um, do they actually have to use the material to be able to get full marks or are you just putting a standalone question tacked onto a scenario, but they don't actually have to use it? So really sort of making sure that there is enough material in that scenario based or in that stimulus material to actually draw something for the question. And then, Peter, I might kind of turn over to you about this question six, really, how are you incorporating scenarios into your SACs? I know I spoke to a couple of teachers a couple of years ago and they said, I've, I'm have i doing a section A and section B in all of my SACs. Others weren't. They were just incorporating. So perhaps some, some advice to some teachers about how you're doing it. Yep. I think there needs to be, um, yeah, I think there needs to be uh, levels of um, where some are fairly uh, straightforward, um, so where they need to, so, you know, justify why a plaintiff should or why a person bringing a civil action should go to CAV and not to VCAT. So if something relatively easy, one that we did for um, uh, SAC 3.2.2 because we divide each of the areas of study in Unit 3 into two and we did one of the SACs was um, when we went into lockdown so we did a second one to, to verify the mark. And we had a data table of the class actions in, since 2002 and what the cause of the action was and the, the main cause was brought by shareholders, second one was negligence and it went down down the list and there's about 180 uh, class actions in the state in the last uh, uh, 16 years. Now students had to use the data table to justify the class actions are an effective means of resolving a dispute. Now that was hard but I was actually surprised at how many of the students could at least look at it and work out um, because we looked at things like the Ruby, you know, Princess. That that, that was fairly clear that that was going to be a, a you know class action, um, and they could actually work out well. And we'd also look one really good case is the Manus Island one because you've got one thousand seven hundred you know people. These are largely you know refugees who would never, um, I would think, under usual you know circumstances, be able to go to the Supreme Court. So we'd done the cases and we looked at the language of it. So when they looked at a very bold set of sort of your numbers, they could at least work out, well, uh, behind the data are people and you've got large, you know, numbers of them. So, but Lisa, I felt at the at the time when we put together the table, it just had year, um, nat nature of the action and um, uh, and that, that was about it. So they had to work that out. But if they if they know the language of the course and if they were if they've had to work through really difficult sort of you know, stuff they can they 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 can easily look at it and say okay i don't need to refer to the stimulus material for the whole of the answer unless sir, i'll pass back to you on this but i don't think that they need to base the whole of the answer on it they need to take some salient you know points and make it a part of the answer and i think that's the main point for them they you know when they look at it and think what am i going to say about about sort of you know, class sections i don't really understand a shareholder action well, we don't really sort of you know, need to, but to, but that that very uh, word would indicate a large number might be sort of involved in that. So, and then um, for them to sort of look at the language of, of the stimulus material and make you know sense of it from what they've done throughout the year, but they don't need to write the whole whole of the answer on that. But it needs to be it needs an element of the scaffolding. Is that? A fair call, Lisa. Yeah, I, think, I think it depends on the question, but I think there's a balance. So I think that if there's if there's sort of a bit of a kind of half cut reference to the source material without actually incorporating it or using it in a meaningful way, I don't think that's using source material. Oh. At the same time, if they if the whole answer is just about the source material, they're probably actually missing the task word as well. So I think it goes back to practice, 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 and read the question, know what it's asking you to do, and which bits of the source material will you draw on and incorporate it into your answer in an organic, natural way, not just a tacked on at the end going, for example, on this blah. Um, it might get them over the line, but it depends on the question. Um, and we've just got a couple of examples of the way that we thought that we would do this. Um, and I know that you probably won't be able to see it, but this one, for example, is a unit one, area study one. We know that synthesis and, and application skills are not a huge emphasis for this one, but we thought we're just going to start getting them introduced to that from the very get go. And this is really an article about um, the religious discrimination bill. And we've got a couple of scenarios about that bill um, in the textbooks. This is another example where we're using um, 
the case in relation to Patrick Cronin and we've got an extract from the judgment and we're asking them some specific questions in relation to um, sentencing and factors considered um, and the purposes of sanctions and the extent to which they'll be achieved in this particular case. So, um, you know, judgments, for example, that can be really long and, and they're really difficult to be able to extract um, the necessary bits. But if you can just sort of pull a little bit, of, a few of the paragraphs like this, for example, lots of ellipses and sort of putting them in, then you'll be able to sort of draw out the relevant bits to be able to then ask them questions specifically about that. I'm conscious of time, so Peter, I might hand over to you and sort of go through these advice for students when giving stimulus material. Yep. Um, when they get something, um, they need to really work out, and this is really the six sort of um, uh, points which I always get mine, mine to do. Uh, the first thing they need to do is work out, well, what part of the course is is it is it actually from and they need to be really you know precise. They should work off the study design um, uh, dot points. And really know, okay, this is what this is what it is. This might look like a lot to read, and if you've looked at the 20, 2019 exam, there was a lot there to read. But if you can, if you, if they can at least isolate the main area right right from the start, they then need to look at the facts. What's the context? Where's it actually from? And then how are the facts relevant to the question? So. I always say to them, don't read the question until you've read the material and you have an understanding of it. Because then you read the question in the context of the material and you, and you can start to link them. Um, what I found that in the first year of this new course in 2018, some of my students would read the questions first and sort of you know, worry about if they could a answer the question. But as Lisa said, they need to use the material to scaffold the answer. That it's not, it can't be just a superficial like, you know, reference. So when they start to give the answer, they need to have a firm idea of what is in the material so they know what to actually draw on. So they only read the question after they think they've got a pretty good handle on, on the material. Um, point four, they then need to connect the questions to the sources. So they need to try to sort of, you know, link them. And then they do what, um, they have always done uh, and that's then start to break down break down the question in the context of the stimulus material and work out how to actually respond to it but really the main thing is that they need to they need to work out what is what what is actually going on here is it a bill is it uh, a judgment from a court it might be the excerpt of a supreme court judgment and that that's if they get the starting point if they get that sort of if they get a foundation of knowing the origin of the material and knowing the process, they should be able to understand the, re the resources there and then they can read the question in the light of understanding the material. They can't do both at the same time. They need to read the material, get a good sort of an awareness of it and then they link the question back. So they really can't do them both at the one time. There's simply too much sort of um, there's too much for them to do and they can't make that link unless they know where is the material and what does it actually mean. Yeah, just the only thing that I would say is, and I tried to, we tried to emphasise this on Monday, is that, you know, every student is very different and, you know, brains, our brains work very differently as well. Um, you know, that just just get the students to practice how they become familiar with the student stimulus material and the questions. It might be, I, I know that me, when I have done examinations in the past, I've read the questions first because I've tried to see what are the questions giving me clues that I need to look for in the stimulus material. And I'm just sort of conscious that some students might want to do that back and forth a little bit. Um, and, it, and again, it goes back to that practice is what what works for them um, and how do they work through the material in a way which makes sense to them. Yep. So uh, what we've got now, this is what I get my students to do for CRIM once they've worked out that that's from um, 3.1, to look out for the facts and always look out for, for the principles and and the factors that's always, should always be in their mind. Uh, what is what what is the severity of um, uh, the crime? Uh, is there has there been a plea? What is what is the stage of the process? Committal, sentencing, appeal, the mitigating and aggravating uh, factors. Um, in terms of the witnesses, um, uh, is is there anyone in the in the case who might be treated as a vulnerable witness? Cost, time, and cultural uh, factors. So they need to know the study uh, design, and they need to be able to read a case study and have all those eight points sort of going and 
the more they can do that after we finish unit 4.2, um, and they can do that fairly uh, quickly, um, but they need to have those eight points in their mind um, when they're actually reading reading through. So um, if they miss one of those um, uh, points, uh, it might mean that they've got a gap in the reading and understanding of the material. Um, same, same for civil, once again, for justice. Um, I don't know how many students don't write, who are meant to write on um, the principles and they just don't, but I think it would be a fair number, Lisa. Students don't really, do they, I mean, that's something which should be almost the basis of their reading of civil and crim, shouldn't it? Like knowing knowing the principles and how they might relate to any sort of set of facts, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, whether to the extent to which they address them in um, responses depends on the question that's asked. But certainly, I mean, I guess they probably need to be thinking about, you know, where where is fairness, equality, or access sort of playing out here, um, and then looking at the questions. Yeah. Yeah. So what they need to do, they need to start with that. Then they need to look at any sort of financial information which has been which has been given um, about the plaintiff or the defendant. The information about about the parties are they a vulnerable person? Uh, what's their level level of education? You know, training uh, background. What is the relationship between the parties? Do they need to maintain that? Do they have any any element of goodwill? And obviously, if they've got an ongoing um, sort of you know difficulty, then if you need to um, justify process such as mediation, you're probably not going to be going down that path if they've uh, had a long standing. Um, period of your will, uh, then look for the facts that might point to some sort of a method or body to actually resolve it, and then obviously you look look at the factors. So um, there's a lot going on in terms of crim and civil. The unit three, um, you know, stimulus material is study design, and they need to have in their head very, very, very clearly as they actually read it, what am I actually looking out for here? And then when they read, read the questions, they know, okay, well, here I'm looking at, you know, a cost factor or, you know, something like that, but they need to know the study design really well and they need to almost have a tick box in their own, in, in their own brain. These are the things that I need to be looking out for. Yep. I think we've got only got a couple of minutes. I'll just I'll quickly just mention something here, and then I'll pass to you, Peter, to to do those um scenarios. But the only other factor to think about in relation to these two slides is obviously there is an integration of all of these areas of study and key knowledge that they need to bring together at the end of unit three and at the end of unit three and four. So then also saying there might well be a scenario that covers Unit 4 and Unit 3 or criminal and civil. So it's about sort of also kind of separating out the scenario as well to be able to identify those key things that are happening as well. Um, okay, Peter. Okay, this is just um, uh, something which, you know, um, I, I will give my uh, – I think I – I don't think we did this on um, Area 3.1 because I think it, uh, it was already done by that stage, but this is the sort of thing which I'd give my uh, students at the end of the year just to, you know, practice. What I would do um, and what, uh, what I am doing, I'm putting this onto a Google Doc, this sort of form. Uh, what we use, we use Classroom – now during the lockdown, I'm sure many many of you do too, and actually I actually post them their own their own um, uh, a document, and they need to go through to annotate. And I've got um, uh, I've got a sample on this on, on this uh, slideshow where they need to pick out the salient points which they think, and then they write the questions which they think a, a VCAR assessor might base it on this. So this is on the Pell judgment and it talks about the role role of the jury. So it's really getting them to read this and then to go back to the course and say, how might the course how might the course link in to the case study? As an example, I think of a Google Yeah. So this is this is the sort of thing I sent this to my students yesterday, um, where you just basically break down this is the TikTok ban, which we were sort of, you know, thinking of, but I think that the Prime Minister said yesterday that things seem, seem fine. But, <laughs> uh, but you know, awesome. yeah, that's true. But what, what I do, I actually give them the scenario, but before they respond to the questions, they need to do the annotation of, of the scenario to show how they've actually, actually broken it down. So I need to see what they've actually gone for and what, what, are the, what have they been, up, been able to pull out of it that have helped them to respond to the questions. Yeah. And that is a really ideal way because then 
what what I find is that if they just respond to the questions, I don't know how they've used the scenario. I, I don't know what they've actually you know gone for. So that helps me to go back to them and say, listen, this this you know point here, this was something which might have been able, which would have been good for you to respond to say question question three. So yeah, I can yeah. I can almost see how they've how they thought their way through. So look, we do one of them pretty well every every um, every day. They get one. Uh, they can do that in about. 20, 20 minutes, I suppose. So really, I do focus on the content of, of the course, but I'm really focused now very much on how do they break down the scenario. And then if they do that well, as you know, Lisa just said earlier, that helps to scaffold the answer. So it, it's a meaningful use of the material. It's just yeah. not kind of, it's just not sort of like, you know, dropped in there. But um, the more you can see how they've thought their way through it, I, th I think the better. Unless you've got some some intro to that slide, Lisa. No. No, I thought it, I I think it's a great idea that um that annotation. I just think it it helps them helps them have some clarity and even sort of colour coding their annotations as well. Um, in terms of the points that they're making, I just think the more that they are deconstructing and which is really what the analysis is, the more they're deconstructing it. And I, I just really like the way that you've set that out in terms of um a, a, um electronic annotation. Yep. Thank you. Okay, and I think we're done. I think it's the last slide. Yeah, so I think that's Peter's lovely face with the video tutorial, which I think he's got uh, <laughs> how to an answer scenario-based questions on the um, on a digital. So we're trying to sort of give as much uh, much support as we can to teachers and to students around this scenario base, and in, in particular having as many scenarios as we can in the book, in particular as practice assessment tasks in um, the Year 11 and the Year 12 textbook. I think that's it from the substantive point from points from Peter and I, and I think it's go over to Kate, I think. Hello again, everyone. Thank you, Lisa and Peter. That was a wonderful presentation. I'm sure you're getting a virtual round of applause right about now. Um, I've got some great questions coming through from the Q&A, so I'll just feed them through to you now. Um, I will just point out to Ron, we technically were going till five o'clock, so um, if you do need to leave us, feel free. Um, we will be looking to distribute the slide deck and also a, a video of the presentation um, in a few weeks once it's been edited and packaged up. So um, don't stress if you do need to step away, you won't um, be missing out. So first of all, Michael asked, um, how would you break down synthesis to students typically struggling to get over 50%? They really struggle to utilise sources. Mm, that's a good question. Um, I mean, one thing I would say about, and I mentioned this on Monday, is the mean for Section B has been slightly higher than the mean for Section A in both the 2018 and the 2019 examination. Now, we can't dissect too much from that, but I think the emphasis needs to be made to students is um, a couple of things. One is they can do it. They have demonstrated that they can do it, and I think a lot of students actually quite enjoy it. I, quite, I think they quite enjoy getting a question that's tacked onto a scenario of stimulus-based material. And the second thing that I would say is try to sort of desensitise them a little bit to the word synthesis, because I think it's a scary word and they think, oh, I don't know how to synthesise. If you try and say, don't worry about whether you're doing it, you probably are doing it. Let's just focus on looking at the question and looking at answering the question in the context of the set of set of facts or scenarios. So I think it's about sort of moving away a little bit, going, are you synthesising, are you synthesising, but saying, look, it's happening a little bit in the background. Um, let's just focus on the question and, and, and the answer. Peter, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, look, I would teach probably... Um five or six students this year and always have who are probably in that in that boat. Um, for them, if they understand the language of the course and really know what to look out for in terms of words and and terms, that helps them a lot to at least be able to grasp well what's the what's the question actually you know dealing with. Um, and then from there they might be able to look for deeper uh, meanings. But um, and, and then I've also taught taught the students who write sort of you know really well and can understand the context but they don't read the language really well so the answer is, isn't that good so they really need to have almost a mechanical building block view of the language of the course if they and if they've got that and that's really an essential thing if they've got that they'll at least be able to understand the material and then they'll be able to go back to the question and try to try to sort of draw the link from there but it really is an it really is a vital thing to be able to look at look at the scenario and understand what are the words that I actually know what what do those words mean and then how do they link to the question if that makes sense 
Yeah, definitely. I think on that point, um, Elizabeth asked in the chat, and you know, you might have just touched on this, but if you could sort of succinctly sum it up for Elizabeth, um, who asked if you have an example of sort of how to synthesize. Uh, <laughs> that would depend on the question, wouldn't it, Lisa? Like, yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, I think it, I think that does depend on the question, um, and I think it then sort of then it's a big question because it's how do you synthesize? How do you pull things together? And I think it is about. I think it depends on the question. I think it depends on um, the material, really, because you're synthesizing different things depending on what you're asking them to do. Yeah. But uh, with that, if they, um, if you go go to the the task word first, that will give you an idea. So if you need to ju justify the proposition that, then the students know well. I need to argue in favour of it. So you know, I justify why Kate should go to cab to return her like her you know shoes, and then at least if they can understand the task word and know what they need to, that will then help them to go back to the material and draw from that in a way that supports the argument which they have to put to satisfy the task word. So, and in yeah. The context, yeah, and in the context of the fact, so who, who, who is it that needs to go to CAV? Um, what are their circumstances? What's the nature of the dispute? So it's breaking down all of that, analysing yeah. all of that and bringing that together to then answer the task word. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Thank you both. Um, anonymous asked, as a first time BC legal studies teacher, I am unsure about how to select scenarios and the sort of questions to use for them. Any suggestions? My my first uh, tip would be to go to Compact to the VCTA. There, there's some wonderful wonderful stuff there. Unless you um, you produce the really fan you've um, done some really really fabulous stuff, which has been on Compact the last few years on that. So I strongly recommend you go 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 to those docs. Um, and I'd be I'd be happy to if you're a first year um, a teacher I'd be happy to send you stuff that I'm that I'm doing so uh, feel free to contact me at my school at Star of the Sea College and I'm happy happy to send you some stuff. Yes, I would also say that the forthcoming editions of Legal Studies for this year at Oxford <laughs> have uh, an abundance of fascinating case studies in there or scenarios I should say, um, and these guys have done an incredible job with Annie Wilson as well who was on Monday's webinar. Um, putting them all into context with questions. Every single uh, scenario that's in there has leveled questions, whether it's in the context of being a practice assessment task or just being um, questions at the end of each topic in the chapter. So um, if you are looking for scenarios, um, yes, the Oxford book can provide that to you in spades. Um, Duncan asked, I'm new to legal studies and very few of my students have critical analysis skills. Do Peter or Lisa have any strategies to quickly develop them? I'm not sure about quickly developing. <laughs> I think it's um it's what what we just said before. It's um it's looking at it's looking at the task word and using the task word as the as the basis on which you uh, draw from the material what you need to answer the question. Yeah. Uh, like Lisa just said before, like if it's uh, a civil case and you need to. So to you know, justify why this, the why the person should go to court or should go go to VCAT, they then go back to the material and they when they draw from that just what they need to answer the question. So uh, there's probably a three way thing there. Like what is what what is the material? What is it? You know, criminal, civil, um, sort of you know whatever, or from unit four. What what does the question want them to do with the material? So. The main thing I would I, I, I would advise is that to say to students, you're not writing on the whole of the material. You're only you only actually drawing from it what you actually need to draw from it to respond to the question. And they need to they need to think, okay, what can I use to actually support the answer? And um, if you look at last year's exam, it's sort of now section B. There was so much there to read. But they don't have to write on every single word in the material. They can, given 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 the question, they can draw from it as they actually need to to you know respond. But really, the more they read, the better. And yeah. what I would do, I would I would strongly advise to do the Google Doc thing where they actually do the annotation. I think that that helps them then to just sort of you know triggers in the brain. What do I what do I look for, and how does this work? And Really, they can do that in about like I, I said. I said one every every day. 
get them to do it, say, for, you know, 10 minutes to 15 minutes, and the more they do it now, they get really, really fast at it as well because they know they become like, it's just not familiar with the terms, but familiar with how things are phrased so yes. they can they can dive into it. Yep. So I think to, 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 the two, one, read widely as much as you can, and two, that practice, even just a daily five to 10-minute practice yep. of um, that reading um, and, and annotating. Definitely. Um, and just finally, um, uh, Anonymous asked, I've been teaching units three and four for years. In my experience, students really struggle to comprehend and respond to questions relating to the principles of justice and also struggle with extended response. Do either of you have specific strategies or resources to help deal with those things? Um, so on the principles of justice, they are tricky um, and they are much broader and require much greater analysis interpretation than the previous elements of a, of a um, effective legal system. I think it's about sort of allowing your stronger students to be able to go deeper into the three principles of justice. Access is, is pretty straightforward, so it's really fairness and equality that's got that sort of deeper lens allowing them to go a little bit deeper about them, but also simplifying it in a way that your um, other, uh, other students, perhaps weaker students, can conceptualise. So splitting and fairness about procedural matters, procedural issues, um, opportunities to, to raise defences or claims, and equality about being vulnerabilities and about being um, treating minorities or treating people who might suffer any form of discrimination in a way that puts them on an equal footing. So about dissecting it in a very simple way, but also letting your um, stronger students go deeper. And I think we've got a couple of worksheets on the principles of justice in the textbook. Um, on the extended response questions, Peter, do you want to address that one? I will. Um, my main main advice is what I say to my uh, students is that the skills you have when you're writing an essay for English or for Global Poll, bring them into legal studies. Have a very, very clear argument. If you need to contend something, make that very, very clear from the start. And for God's sake, use paragraphs and topic, you know, sentences to develop the argument. So what I find is that they they don't they don't necessarily think well the skills the skills of essay writing can be brought over to legal studies. I mean, you they they can do that unless you would know you've been mark, marking for years. If it's if it's really well laid out, it doesn't have to be brilliantly written. But if it's clear in terms of, you know, paragraphing and topic sentences where the argument flows, then they can, and if it's an eight marker or more, if they come at it from writing a mini essay, and if they think of it in those terms, they tend to draw on knowledge which they've got, which they may not get if they just write whatever they know. So for them to think, okay, I'm going to write four or five body, body paragraphs here, I'm going to use topic sentences and evidence. It helps them to be able to, you know, structure it in a way that actually uh, we can see what the argument is and how they've drawn draw, drawn from the course. So it's really a mindset. I think not to look at not to look at the ten marker as just being a longer version of a five marker. It's a separate beast, and they need to lay it out like that. Yeah, I totally agree. I think we've actually got a video tutorial about extended response questions, but I think it's, it's it, this is a bit sort of not rocket science, but it's about structuring of answers. And make sure you listen to me and not my three-year-old in the background, because um, she might be turning away. Um, it's about structure. I think it's about planning that response, um, particularly through your reading time. I'm sorry, she's singing in the background, so I might just mute myself and pass over to Kate. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. Um, don't worry, I think she's a hit. And someone else also posted that um, in the chat that your baby picture behind you is beautiful. So I'm sure your kids are very welcome cameos. I am just going to um, take you guys through a quick um, quick fire tour of some of the new features of the forthcoming Legal Studies for VCA editions. And Lise is also going to do a little bit of a um, chat over the new and recent um, criminal and civil cases in the Year 11 book and the recent recommended criminal and civil reforms. Um, that we have in the Year 12 book as well. So here we have the product and pricing information, get the sort of boring stuff up, up in the first slide so that we can talk about the nitty gritty um, actual detail of the books in a minute. Um, so here you see that the student books are priced at 74.95 each. Um, and uh, that includes access to Obook Assess, which is our digital platform, which houses all of these great resources that these guys have been talking about today. So worksheets, videos, tutorials, um, 
uh, on the teacher over access, there's a full answer key for all of the um, questions in the book and the practice um, assessment tasks. Um, a whole wealth of digital stuff on there to support your um, students' learning, um, as well as uh, yourself as a teacher. So we have uh, lesson plans for every topic, um, annotated samples, stacks, um, yeah, and anything you can think of to support you guys um, on the digital uh, platform. And a lot of it is also customizable, so you can download it and um, customize it uh, to suit your own teaching program. Um, so I thought I would talk a little bit briefly about what's new in the digital digital space. Um, we're very excited to be doing some brand new um, digital things with these editions of Legal Studies. So first of all, on the left hand side of the screen there, you can see that um, there is a mock-up of a, a phone and an app. Um, we're partnering with Quizlet for this new these new editions, which I know that some of you might already be using in your classrooms. Um, our third author, Annie Wilson, who was on Monday's session, uses it uh, to great success with her students. Um, Quizlet is a, uh, an app or a website which um, we will be able to use to house our professional OUP um, top-notch content, um, but it will be delivered to your students in a um, fun and accessible way. So they can use it on their phone, on the go. Um, or they can use it on their browser, but um, it's a really great revision tool. And it also has a uh, competitive element. So you as the teacher can set up a Quizlet Live um, competitive game where students have to essentially play their knowledge to win. Um, so yeah, really excited about that. And it will be really clearly signposted in the book um, for each chapter when you can have access to some Quizlet content. Um, we also, on the right-hand side, for the first time ever, will be introducing a markbook feature. So there will be uh, quizzes for each topic within each chapter of the book so that you can track your students' progress um, through the uh, book and therefore through the course. The really cool thing about our markbook that we're excited about is that you can add customizable assessments or custom assessments rather. So um, as well as what you're seeing them do on the Oxford platform, if you were um, having them do things in class or online, you could add them in there and sort of have a one-stop shop, um, or like helicopter view of uh, the class and their performance. So in terms of what is new in the book, um, we did run a survey towards the end of last year that I'm sure some of you probably participated in in terms of what um, they like, what you liked about the book and what you'd like to see changed. And we were very chuffed to hear that you didn't want too much changed. So um, there have been some carefully considered changes, um, but not too many. So over 80% of the legal scenarios throughout the series have been updated to be more relevant or new and recent um, cases. We've also updated the review spreads at the end of each chapter to be more targeted towards um, exam success. So there's three top tips from that specific chapter written by our brilliant authors, um, three exam style graded questions, bringing in the, the task or command word, and also a practice assessment task, um, which we did have in the previous editions, but many of them have been updated to be uh, more relevant or recent scenarios. We've um, We've paired it back to be a bit more laser focused. So some of you who might have used the previous editions would know that we have uh, the going further sections in the current uh, books. We've stripped them out and put them online just to enhance the, the focus of the student book to be as tied to the curriculum and, and easy to get through as possible. Um, the authors have also done an amazing job of, of sort of taking uh, potentially confusing and and um, difficult content and sort of distilling it into really clear, easy to read formats like tables or diagrams for students. And finally, um, we've also updated the scenario, the terminology throughout to, to be more reflective of the study design. So again, if you're using us currently um, or have in the past, you know that we have um, case studies and in the news features and extracts and et cetera, et cetera. And we've just really simplified it um, to reflect the syllabus, so there are actual scenarios, so cases that actually happened, whether they're news reports or judgments or whatever it may be, and hypothetical scenarios, um, which are, of course, hypothetical. Um, but what we have also done is kept the great features that um, we heard from you guys that you didn't want us to get rid of. So there's still the Legal Studies Toolkit chapter at the beginning of each book to provide clear course information, exam advice, um, how to master legal citation, things like that. Each unit um, begins with an introductory chapter, 
to cover off key concepts and essential prior knowledge. Then um, on a chapter level, there is the chapter opener spread, which succinctly has key outcomes, key knowledge, key terms from the study design. And then throughout the chapter, there are margin notes, um, glossary terms, study tips, did you know, little tidbits. There's a, a range of uh, level questions found at the end of every single topic. And last but not least, uh, our amazing author team, so Lisa and Peter and um, Annie Wilson, are back to bring their incredible knowledge and expertise to each book. I'm just going to hand back over to Lisa to take you through the um, new and updated uh, cases that we've put, or some of the new, new and updated cases that we've put into both books. So back to you, Lisa. Yeah, so um, as you know, as part of Unit 2, you need to, the students need to study two recent and two, um, two recent criminal and two recent civil. So we've refreshed the ones that we've currently got in the textbook to deal with these ones. So Peter has um, had a go, uh, done a great job of doing these um, criminal cases, with the first one being the large hole case of um, the youth offender who uh, murdered um, large hole at an Airbnb um, on a weekend. Um, we dealt with the Rostevsky case, which uh, and I mentioned um, before, it's quite an interesting case from a criminal law perspective. We looked at the Haberfield case, which was the assault of a female paramedic um, late one night and resulted in some sort of changes in legislation in relation to emergency workers. And then we've looked at the trials and acquittal of George, Cardinal George Powell um, as the fourth criminal case. And in the civil case, what we looked at was um, a criminal reporter who sued the age in relation to vicarious trauma. So a really interesting case um, about not being directly affected by crime, but indirectly affected and suing as a result. We're looking at the Uber and taxi class action. Um, so really that hones in Peter's comment about sort of thousands of people being able to sort of seek um, sort of compensation um, in relation to a class action. We looked at um, a VCAT case. So a Docklands, um, a, ca a case in, in relation to a, a Docklands Tower um, getting $5 million in damages. And then we've looked at um, a Nicola Gobbo related case where Farouk Gorman is suing for his 12 years in prison um, and he was just recently acquitted because of the information that was passed on um, by Nicola Gobbo to the police. And then we kept the Rebel Wilson case, but we moved it onto the digital because that will remain recent until 2022. Um, but what we wanted to do was put in the um, book, as you can see, each of them are 2019 or 2020 cases, which means that they will each remain recent until 2023. So it takes you through a few years and so you don't have to refresh them. We have, um, what we've done is we paired back the number of recent recommended reforms in, in Unit 3, Area Study 1 and Area Study 2, because we found that a lot of teachers were finding them a bit overwhelming how many were in there. So we just basically focused on three of them of each of them um, to give you some choices and really honed in the principles of justice for each of them. So recent, we looked at the expansion of the Curry Court, um, something a little bit more straightforward, particularly for those students who might struggle with recent reforms, looking at the victim support dog program for vulnerable witnesses. And we looked at the changes to committal proceedings in relation to sexual offences. And again, they're from 2019 and 2020. And recommended we looked at the expansion of the Curry Court, judge alone trials, which is highly topical at the moment, and increased funding for legal aid, which always is a recommended reform, um, no matter who you talk to. Um, in the civil space, we looked at group class orders and class actions, which came into effect a couple of months ago. Technological improvements in the legal system, which is this year as well in relation to COVID and the expansion of BCAT's fast track mediation and hearing processes, um, which used to be called the short mediation and hearing. And then recommended, um, you can see those there, but um, those are the three recommended that we've got. And then Annie's dealt with um, law reform. She's looked at the BLRC committal system. Um, we, we don't have access to the report, but we've dealt with it in the book. Um, she's looked at the new, new bill proposing drug testing um, and then looked at the Lawyer X Royal Commission, which is the um, police informants one. So they're the ones that we've um, dealt with in, in the textbooks. I think that's it, is it? Is that this? Yep, perfect. So um, in terms of uh, everyone on the call and what happens next, I just wanted to let you know that we do have sample content now available if you wanted to check it out. Um, just visit oup.com.au forward slash VCE hyphen legal. We have some sample pages that you can um, have a little flick through. And also, um, as of this week, we have digital samples available. So you can go on and have a play around to see what 
that Markbook and Quizlet integration will look like um, on the uh, digital dashboard. Um, it's a true representation of what it would look like if it was in your own Oxford Digital Library, so that's very exciting. And of course, if you have any questions about anything you've uh, heard here today, or any questions in general about um, any of our Oxford products, um, contact your local Oxford uh, education consultant. Um, you can use that link there, or their details are listed on the next slide. Um, and again, if you don't know who to contact, um, you can just visit oup.com.au forward slash contact. So I think that takes us to the end. Yes, um, thank you all so much for attending. Again, very grateful to have such high engagement. Um, so thank you all so much. And um, a big virtual round of applause for Lisa and Peter. And um, stay safe and well, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>